Hello, Empire Podcast listeners. Anita here. Look, this episode is going to be one perhaps if you're of a delicate disposition or you've got small children or even slightly bigger children who don't like gory story. You may not want to listen to it with them. Anyway, just a friendly warning. On with the show. Hello and welcome to Empire with me, Anita Arnand. And me, William Durrimple. Now we have something very important to clear up. Um, so there was an awful... <laughs> this awful is you and your loins, isn't I, it? I'm slightly <laughs> obsessed with the... Which for some reason you started me off. I know it's girding your loins. You've seen girt your loins and it's not a T, it's a D. Girding your loins. And I just girt, was... It's slightly different. It's sea girt walls. Yes, I know. Clad. But that's... But, 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 but then why did why, Then why did you say it? Yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Girt, girt, girt is a verb. Girt <laughs> is a noun. Yeah, you, you're saying this, Professor, as if you knew this all along. <laughs> you were the one who was Girting. <laughs> when I I just went along with you girting. Okay, so it's a biblical thing, and I have found a guide to how to gird up your loins. <laughs> okay. Where have you found this, I, I this have girding means. guide? Well, I'll tell you, the girding is the girl gird, gird guides. Um, anyway, so in biblical times, people used to wear very long tunics and they were heavy and they came down to your ankles and you wouldn't be able to, you know, fight in battle. So girding means to hoik them. And there are steps to this. Number one. Hoik, that's the Scots translation of gird. Okay, okay. so number one. Hoik. Hoist up your tunic so all the fabric is above your knees. This will give you mobility. Then gather all the extra material in front of you so the back of the tunic is snug against your backside. I hope you're all taking notes. This is a bit like wearing a kilt. No, it's more like a nappy. The excess (laughs) fabric is gathered in front to pull it underneath and between your legs and to your rear. This feels much like a diaper. (laughs) There you go, nappy, told you. And then next step number four, half of the material in each hand, bringing it back around the front and then you tie it in a knot. You are literally pulling up your skirt twizzling it up and tying it up at the front. Can we get back to the first Afghan war, Anita? It's all very well girding your loins, but... <laughs> back to the we serious any, business. We never anyway, disappear down rabbit holes. Ever. Listen, if you ever want to gird your loins, look online. There is a step-by-step guide. Uh, okay, so look, at the last episode of Empire, we were talking about how the Brits thought they, you know, they, they'd done pretty well. They'd made it through a horror narrow pass. They'd managed to take Ghazni without a cannon being fired. Dost Muhammad is lying in a pit somewhere uh, and is unable to challenge their candidate, Shah Shuja. And it all seems peachy with, you know, what you were saying, pheasant shoots or pigeon shoots and cow, pigs sticking ducks, ducks, ducks and all of, yeah, that kind of thing. And amateur theatricals. Wherever the British go, the amateur theatrical follows. Plus, yes, Lady sales, sales piano. Piano, <laughs> piano recitals given by her daughter, Anne Exonic. Turns out, I just checked, turns out it wasn't Lady Sale who played the piano herself. It was her beautiful daughter, Anne who was the only girl uh, in the whole contumement and therefore the object of the affection of 10,000 men. Right, okay. Which she enhanced by playing piano. Anyway. Well, I mean, she's a one, isn't she, Lady (laughs) Sale? Isn't she a one? Okay, so I'm going to start with a quote, and then uh, you can tell us what this all means to us. Okay, William. At 9 a.m., the troops moved off, a crouching, drooping, dispirited army, so different from the smart, light-hearted body of men they appeared some time ago, the men sinking a foot deep into snow each step. My heart sunk within me under the conviction that we were a doomed force. This is very different to the duck shooting merriment that we were talking about in the last episode. It is indeed. And what you just read was a very moving description by somebody called George Lawrence of the retreat from Kabul, which is the subject of today's podcast. And we left you last time with the British in control of Kabul, having invaded Afghanistan. But very quickly, their position grows more and more tenuous. When they try and cut their costs, they sack half the nobles in Shah Shuja's court. The nobles then murder the post boys and cut the communications with India. And very soon, it's clear that the thing is getting very tense and, and it's about to blow. But this doesn't stop Alexander Burns from seducing the girlfriend of Abdullah Khan Achaksai, 
And we left you last time with Abdullah Khan Achakzai gathering his troops and saying, we've got to stop the British right here, right now. Otherwise, they will continue to ride the donkey of their desires into the field of stupidity. Mm. And that's exactly what they did do. Mm. And what happens is that the mob, which Abdullah Khan Achakzai gathers, goes straight to the House of Burns. Uh, they demand that the girl be given up. Burns appears at the top window out of his bath in his dressing gown. Of oh, course, because that's going to no help. Way. There's a sort of Hugh Hefner look is going to enhance his possibilities with the crowd of angry men. Mm. And... Uh, the crowd begins shooting at him. Uh, he has a bodyguard which shoots back. This is because he has chosen to live in the old town of Kabul, away from the other British. So there's no artillery or uh, any sort of, uh, you know. No one's coming to help him. him. No, no one's, one's coming to help him. him. Yeah. And then they start shooting lighted arrows uh, and firing them into his house. And the whole thing catches fire very quickly. And as he rushes out with his girlfriend, they hack him to pieces. What happens to her? I mean, does anyone know what happens to her? I can't think it's great. No, I don't think it's going to be a happy ending, that story, mm. either. Mm. Uh, and he is the first victim of the uprising. And as we know in Afghanistan, once uprisings and jihads begin, they tend to gather momentum very quickly. Mm. The British suddenly realised, belatedly, having done you know amateur theatricals and duck shoots and Scottish reels for a year now, um, the British suddenly realised that their cantonment is in a completely indefensible position. It hasn't got defensive walls. It is sitting beneath a whole ring of mountains. Shah Shuja is the opposite end of Kabul, the far side of the old town on the Bala Hissar, which is a fortified area, but they've chosen not to move in there because Shah Shuja wanted his space. Yeah, I mean, Bala Hissar, we should say, is like a very ancient castle of Afghan kings. It's, you know, it it, it is fortified with very thick I mean, what what period do we know? Where do, well, it's still do we know there, when it was still built? There today. I mean, it was old when Alexander passed uh, in its initial form. Right, exactly. So it's a it's an age old fortress. Yeah, but I think in its current form, uh, the Shah Shuja's grandmother was a Mughal princess, and she rebuilt the buildings within very much in the Mughal style, right? With these beautiful wooden pillared halls that are there in the lithographs. Very little of this survives inside the fort today, mm. which has now just got barracks inside. Mm. Um, I managed to get permission to get inside uh, on one occasion, although that's where all the intelligent departments uh, were based. And um, the walls survive very, very well, but the in very little of the interior pavilions, rather like the Red Fort in Delhi, is, is just modern barracks. How do you, the hell did you get in there if the intelligence services were sitting in there? Because I met some of the people from the intelligence services. Oh, okay. Uh, and <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, was, right. there was one point when I was following the route of the retreat from Kabul, exactly the, the story we'll be telling over the next 40 minutes. Mm. And this was considered to be rather foolhardy. And the British representative sent me off to these guys to get a little panic button, which is a thing you can put in your pocket. It's the shape of a compass and mm. a, a small thing. And you can press it if you get into trouble. And it allows you, I think, 20 seconds of audio, which you're meant to identify your captors. Wow. Uh, which I'm glad to say I never actually used. Uh, but um, so I'd, I'd met these guys and, and, and went up to the fort. Okay, okay. So you were legitimately there because I was thinking, yeah. you know, I mean, as much as I adore you, and you know I adore you, James Bond, you are not. <laughs> it's like swinging That's through a, a window. Very kind <laughs> swinging, assessment. I've always rather Swinging through myself. a window of Bala Hissar to kind of look at shifty around. Okay, that explains that. Okay, so there's no, Shashuja. There were no climbing ropes. There were no. <laughs> Grappling no, no, iron. Crampons. No. So, okay. So, Shashuja is at the other end of town. He can't help. Burns has just been hacked to pieces. But when the blood is up, the blood is up. What happens next? So, the Afghans quickly realise that the British have not even bothered to defend their military supplies. And through some idiotic uh, decision, they had put their military supplies in a small fortress near the Bala Hassar, the opposite end of the plain from the cantonment. And so the first thing the Afghans do after they've killed Burns is to go and raid the British supplies and capture all their cannon wow. and their gunpowder and their spare rifles. Wow. And they use all these immediately against the British. They haul the cannon up onto the mountains above the cantonment and begin shelling the British cantonment with their own cannon. So what is McNaughton? McNaughton, um, glass half full and not rose tinted, but blue tinted spectacles on. What does he do? So McNaughton is completely taken surprised by this. He hasn't seen it coming. He thinks the Afghans are, uh, he calls them children. 
uh, <laughs> they are children. They will, they will, they will come round when their father uh, tells them to behave. He says, and he goes out to meet the one of the leaders, Akbar Khan, of the uprising. And because there's this from the beginning, there's complete chaos. The the British military commander is a guy called Elphinston. He's known as Elfie Bay by Emily Eden, who'd had him grouse shooting in Scotland. Uh, they first met him. And he got the job because mm. he was Auckland's old grouse shooting companion. But he hasn't seen action since Waterloo, which is now I think, 30 years Good earlier. <laughs> oh. And he's got gout. And he could barely get onto his horse. And anyway, so when the news comes that Burns' house has been burnt down mm. and Burns has been burnt to death, Elphinstone gets onto his horse. He falls off his horse. The horse falls on him. And that's Elphinstone out of wow. the picture for, uh, for, for the rest of the uprising. By the way, that's unusual. That's how, um, I mean, you know, in, in many years' time, Robert Peel, uh, the, you know, the prime, former Prime Minister of Great Britain, that's how he dies. He's on a horse. His horse falls his, on his, him, yes, he? His, yeah. he, he falls off the horse, horse falls on him and crushes him to death. Mm, interesting. Anyway, Ethelson aside. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the whole Elphinson is no more in action. Elphinson's out of action. Then who takes over? So McNaughton decides, I'm going to sort this out. I'm going to go and meet the rebel leader. And he meets Dos Muhammad's son, Akbar Khan at an arranged spot. And because there's chaos, the escort, which is meant to be supporting McNaughton, uh, does not arrive. So McNaughton just goes with, I think, three bodyguards, right. including this character, George Lawrence. And previously, as a, a measure of, uh, of peacemaking, McNaughton has sent his horse and carriage as a present to Akbar Khan the night before. And on arrival at this meeting, he presents... Akbar Khan with two very lovely pistols that he'd admired on a previous meeting. So he's busy buttering up Akbar Khan and thinks he can sort out this child, as he calls him. Mm. What he hasn't expected is that Akbar Khan is now so furious because his father, Dost Muhammad, is still locked up in the pit in Bukhara. Uh, he regards McNaughton as being responsible for destroying his, his father's kingdom, and he's in no mood to make peace. He makes a sign to his, his men. Uh, Lawrence and the other three companions are pinioned and he shoots McNaughton with the pistols he's just been given. Wow. And then cuts him up. And McNaughton's body is paraded on a meat hook in the bazaar. Wow. So Burns is out. McNaughton's out. Shashuja is under siege in the Balahisar. Elphinstone has fallen off his horse and the horse has fallen on him. Mm. And so it's left to this deeply unpleasant man called Brigadier Shelton. Mm -hmm. to organize the defense. And Shelton is, by all accounts, a complete fool. And he marches his army out onto the top of a hill above the cantonment and forms a perfect square. Now, the last time he had seen action at Waterloo, this had been the solution. The British squares were the famous unbreakable thing that saw off Napoleon. But it's not what's suitable in Afghanistan, where the Afghans are all armed with these long jazails that can fire about half a mile. Yeah, and they can sort of sit behind rocks and high up places and meet their mark very easily. Exactly that. Mm. And so Shelton has marched his force up, uh, up top of the hill. They, put, they sit like a parade ground in a square and the Afghans just shoot up at them. And Shelton just stands there for two hours, not sure what to do, as line after line of his troops are picked off. Wow. And then he marches the stragglers down, and they are ambushed by Afghan cavalry as they march down the hill, and only a few of them make it in. And, and this is the point when it really becomes clear that there's going to be no uh, solution to this. Plus, in between the burning down of Burns's house and, and Burns's death and this final humiliating battle with Shelton's square being picked apart by Afghan snipers. In between that, winter snow has arrived and blocked the passes to India. So the last mm. hope, I think the whole thing was deliberately done so that the, it was done at a time when it would be impossible to reinforce the British cantonment. They were on their own. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the, the winters have so often been a, a pivotal player in both Russia and in Afghanistan. Uh, I know, I mean, from all the bloodshed that you've just talked about, this seems almost ridiculous to mention, but I will anyway. Uh, the grand piano got burned, in case you're wondering. <laughs> just, <laughs> the foxhounds got eaten. The foxhounds got eaten. <laughs> they ran out of duck. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's all horrific, story. but I just thought I'd flag it because we've been banging on about that piano for quite a long time. Um, so the winter is setting in. And this, I suppose, is the backdrop for that first quote that I gave of the sad trudging through snow, because they've got to get the hell out of Dodge now, don't they, the Brits? 
So what happens next is that there are protracted negotiations with Akbar Khan. And Akbar Khan is rather a movie hero. He's very good looking. We have accounts from people from the, as early as the 1830s talking about this sort of matinee idol look so, of Akbar Khan. And there are epic poems, which I've um, uh, had translated for this by my great friend Bruce Winnell, who does these wonderful translations of Afghan poetry which, you know, go into sort of unnecessary detail about Akbar Khan's marriage night. He's very much the kind of Bollywood movie idol of Afghanistan in the mm. 1830s. And he has every intention of making sure the British never, ever dare set foot in Afghanistan ever again. I just looked him up uh, for... <laughs> <laughs> he's got yeah. like a Shah Rukh Khan sort of Well, looks. no, I mean, for it's those who don't know, there is there is something, yeah, no, he's a good-looking good looking fella. Um, aquiline sort of features and uh, very sort of, you know, th- th- pronounced sort of arm and shape eye and, um, yeah, he's good-looking. Anyway, moving He's a good-looking on. boy. Yeah. Anyway, he drags out the negotiations. And the British can't work out what's going on because they are prepared to march out. They're going to be allowed to take their small arms. They have to surrender contumments and all their artillery. And they can't quite work out what the problem is. And what actually happening, of course, is that Akbar Khan is preparing a whole series of ambushes that are going to wipe out the whole army. And he has no intention of letting a single man get out alive. But this is going to take some time. So for two weeks, the negotiations uh, go backwards and forwards and the British begin to run out of food. They begin to run out of firewood. The temperature drops. The blizzards begin. And by the time that the retreat begins on the 6th of January, there is about four feet of snow on the ground outside the cantonments. And already the Afghans begin to break into the cantonments and take all the artillery and all the stuff that they've been given. And the retreat begins at 9am in this sort of freezing blizzard. And we have, we have some horrific accounts, one of which, and you'll enjoy this, Anita, mm. is by my great great uncle, Colin McKenzie. Oh, not another who is one. Present. Are you serious? <laughs> I am oh, serious. For goodness sake. <laughs> uh, we like to have at least one uncle in every episode. Just, of this, podcast. this is getting ridiculous. Okay. It's, who is this? Look him up. Colin McKenzie. Colin McKenzie. Of the Afghan War is uh-huh. one of the best looking men you've ever seen because okay. he's dressed up in Afghan kit. Okay. So, um, what, does, what does Uncle Colin do? <laughs> <laughs> uncle Colin writes an account and says, I always remembered as one of the most heart-rending sights of that humiliating day, fixing my eyes by chance on a little Hindustani child, perfectly naked, sitting on the snow with no mother or father near her. She was a beautiful little girl, about two years old, just strong enough to sit upright with her little legs doubled underneath her, hair curling in waving locks around a soft little throat, and her great black eyes dilated to twice their normal size fixed on the armed men, the passing cavalry, and all the strange sights that met her gaze. Many other children as young as innocent I saw slain on the road, and women with their long dark hair wet with their own blood. The rear guard had to fight their whole way out to Bagrami, the first day's camp, and pass through literally a continuous line of poor wretches, men, women, and children dead and dying from the colds and the wounds, who, unable to move, and treated their comrades to kill them and put an end to their misery. That's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. It's a nightmare. And the sniping from the minute the British, they've been promised a safe passage. But these are Afghan children and these are, you know, sort of native. No, no. So who who are these? Afghan children. So one always got to remember with East India companies, the armies are not white. Brits. Of course, they're white British of course officers, they're sepoys, but, yes. the, but they're sepoys. So these are sepoys and sepoys families. And the sepoys sometimes have their families, but they also have camp followers who are, right. you know, the Sices daughters and the and the cooks and the, and the cleaners, cooks children, and this sort of stuff. Wow. And as okay. we saw on the way in, you know, as well as all the pickles and the potted hams and all the kind of stuff that they were bringing in, the cheroots and the eau de cologne, there were hundreds of camp followers who are always treated uh, with with disdain and never provided for. Of course. And and now they have to retreat along with the sepoys and along with the, there's a very small number. I think there's two regiments of British army troops led by Shelton and the rest is East India Company soldiers who are from Avad and from Bengal. Uh, they're mm. Indians from North India. And they're way out of their comfort zone. There's one regiment of East India Company horse, Skinner's horse, led by James Skinner's son also called mm. James, who's called Handsome Jim and, one, and, and an incredibly cheery guy, but he doesn't make it beyond day two of the retreat. 
we have many accounts of this because almost everyone who was part of it wrote an account to make sure that nothing like this ever happened again. And the first night, they're just camping where the airport now is. They have made it no further than about six miles from the old city. So, I mean, you're talking about Kabul Airport, which was the center of so many people's, um, you know, attention with the retreat, the American retreat from there. Exactly that. Uh, and so they make it to Bagrami, where the modern airport is. And behind them, the night sky turns red because the Afghans, having looted the contumers, just as they did in Bagram two years ago when the Americans retreated, they then set light to the cantonments. And so there's no retreat. Well, well, I was going to say there's no clearer way of saying your only way is forward. So they burn it behind them. And then the night cold sets in. And because these are Hindustani sepoys from UP, where they have you know these really hot summers and, yeah. and, and no real winter to speak of, nothing that a single shawl won't sort out, none of these guys know what to do. And they lie. If they haven't got tents, they just lie in the snow. And when they wake up the following morning, on the first morning of the retreat, they find that their fingers and their toes have gone black and look like burnt wood. This is frostbite. Mm-hmm. And within the next couple of days, their fingers and toes fall off. And they continue to have to retreat. And they're on the hands and knees. Yes. And then the sniping starts again. And again, and it's relentless horror. It is like a relentless nightmare for these people. The Afghans know how to survive. I mean, they know they're, they're, they're hardy people who know this land. So they are able to survive and fight in these conditions because they dig foxholes. They cover themselves with shawls, shawls with like, you know, there's burning coals. So can I just describe this? Because I, 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 I saw this. I mean, I've, I've seen sort of, you know, Peshwari men do this, which is burning embers in a a kind of like a tin almost or a clay pot and that hangs around the body around the neck I guess and sort of down low and then you've got a shawl on top of it so you've got insulation and you've got heat and they go body to body they mm. lie next to each other using their each other's body heat to keep them uh, from freezing right. and they as you say they completely cover themselves with shawls and mm. nothing is open to the air and as a result the Afghans wake up very cold following morning, but with all their bits intact. Yeah, they've got all well, their fingers and toes. One, yeah. the is Lady Sale still, is she alive? So she's still retreating with this group, so isn't Lady she? Lady Sale and her daughter, Alexandra, who is, I think, six months pregnant oh, Lord. at this point, yeah. is retreating. She's down the turban and she is uh, leading the retreat uh, because she is this extraordinary, indomitable figure. She doesn't have a husband anymore because mm. her husband has led a force to Jalalabad and is now besieged in Jalalabad. And we should say, at the same time as Kabul has fallen apart, better organized generals have successfully defended themselves. So Fighting Bob Sale has gathered sheep and resources and is sitting very happily in Jalalabad to the south. Mm. Another man called Sir William Knott, who is by far the most experienced general, but who is too plain spoken for Auckland and has a uh, a regional accent which Auckland doesn't like and he gets sent off to Kandahar mm. and not is basically should have been in charge of the whole thing but Shelton is put above him and Shelton's an idiot Shelton is a complete idiot and has, yeah. has screwed everything up while not has kept perfect order in Kandahar so it isn't like it couldn't have been done it's that there were complete idiots in charge and they screwed up. Okay, so this retreat continues and those who can still walk continue to walk or trudge through this ever horrifying scene of snow and blood and frostbite. And Akbar Khan has arranged brilliant ambushes at every point. He's built special sniper positions the whole way south. Oh, tell us about the Kurd Kabul. I mean, again, the Kurd Kabul Pass is such an important place. First of all, the topography of it. Kerr Kabul Pass is still the way you get to Kabul by land. Uh, and I've done it. And it's this sort of dizzying descent. It's a very, very steep journey. I, I did this with an ex Taliban general who'd come in to join Karzai. Mm. And uh, I, he was sent as my a man called Jigdalik, who was a. I was a former Afghan Olympic wrestling champion. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I went down the Kerr Kabul to following this route with, with this guy. How, how wide is it? Well, the modern road has blasted a, a, a modern way through it, but the old road, which is the one that was taken at the time, is very narrow and very, very steep. So narrow with like very absolutely precipices on one side. 
but perfect for snipers. And yeah. and what you have again is this is the moment when the Brits finally realize they've got the wrong weapons. They've got the old musket, the Brown Bess, which doesn't have rifling in the barrel. It just has this enormous slug. And this was an extraordinary weapon, which won, for example, the Battle of Culloden and the Battle of Plassey and and all these all these colonial battles that the East India Company had fought. But it's not good for mountain warfare because it's something to be used at short distance. It's mm-hmm. a, it's a lead slug like a dum dum bullet that expands inside the victim. But the Afghans have got these jazales with long barrows, which you see the Mughals using from the 1640s, which are heavy and difficult to use, but they are sniper efficient. They can be fired from half a mile. And the whole way down this pass, the Afghans are in position with their jazales, waiting for the British, picking them off. So, I mean, one of the, one of the um, accounts says, you know, it's this, these Giselles uh, are so unmistakable in their character. It can never be forgotten by those whose ears have once been startled by their unfamiliar sound. I mean, what, what, what is that unfamiliar sound? Why do they sound different to other weapons? So what they hear as they enter a valley is this high ringing sound. And it's very eerie because it echoes across all the valleys. And the Brits don't know what it is initially. What it is, in fact, is the ramrods of the Afghans going down the barrels, ramming the shot and the gunpowder down the barrel. But it makes this very distinctive noise. And metal and if on metal. people do it, metal on metal, mm. uh, with this rhythmic, repetitive sound. And mm. they can't see where it's coming from, but this is the Afghan snipers preparing for the arrival of the army. So the first day they leave, there are about 12,000 camp followers, so ordinary Indians who've come to look after the army as a job of work protecting about 6,000 East India Company and British troops. By the first night, 1,000 are dead. The second night, there's only, I think, 3,000 left. Then they go on this massive high pass uh, where they are at their most exposed to the cold, and I think only 500 come down. And there they are met by the, the famous Holly Hedge at Chigdulloc. And the... Hakbar Khan has actually built a barrier using holly, the, holly uh, bushes, the, the holly bushes, mm. to make sure that uh, that no one can get over it, and not even the cavalry can make mm. it over this. They try and jump it, they get caught on it, and there's thorns, and there's it's it's very cleverly built. And at that point, I think only about two hundred men make it over the holly hedge. This I mean, is extraordinary. Of around twelve thousand, only two hundred. I mean, that's just bloodshed on on such an awful, awful scale. And this is the point at which Elphinstone insists that the ladies surrender. And my ancestor, Colin Mackenzie, survives and writes his memoir because he's one of the men, the officers instructed to lead the women to Akbar Khan, who's mm. off to give them safe passage. Now, Akbar Khan has broken every agreement that he's made so far. He's murdered McNaughton. He's prepared ambushes where he promised safe passage, yeah. but they have no option but to trust him on this. So they hand over their women, Lady Sale, her daughter, Alexandra, and all the other women in the camp are handed over with the single man, Colin McKenzie, there to guard them. Mm-hmm. And they become the hostages. H- how are they treated? Does he, how do, what does he say? On this occasion, Akbar Khan treats them admirably, and they all live to write memoirs, uh, as we'll hear later on. It's time to take a break now. But before I do that, I'd like to just give a little reading from my book, Return of a King, about what happened to the troops when they met the Holly Hedge. By nine the following night, after a day under continual fire, and when it was clear that all the remaining leaders had been either captured or killed, most of the survivors, now maddened with hunger and especially with thirst, after being marching or rather hunted like wild beasts for 24 hours, decided that their only hope was to press on in the dark. They found, however, their way was blocked by a formidable thorny barrier of prickly holly oak, well twisted together about six feet high, which had been erected across the narrowest part of the pass. Those who tried to tear it down with their bare hands or claw their way up it were shot down as they did so. Very few made it over. One who failed to do so was a sepoy named Sita Ram, who later wrote his memoirs. Incidentally, this memoir has sometimes been considered to be a fake and has now been proved to be a genuine article. So this is an Indian sepoy from Benares recording what happened to him at the Holly Hedge that night. He said, when the General Saab left, all discipline fell away. 
As a result, the Afghans were able to annoy us all the more. A number of sepoys and followers went across to the enemy in an effort to save their lives. My regiment had disappeared and I attached myself to the remnants of a European regiment. I thought that by sticking to them I might have some chance of getting away from this detestable country. But, alas, who can withstand fate? We went on fighting and losing men every step of the road. We were attacked in front, in the rear, at the top of hills. In truth, it was hell itself. I cannot describe the horrors. At last we came to a high wall that blocked the road. It tried to force this, our whole party was destroyed. The men fought like gods, not men, but numbers prevailed against them. I was struck down by a gazelle ball on the side of my head. When I came to, I found that I'd been tied crossways upon a horse, which was being led rapidly away from the fighting towards Kabul. I now learned that I was being taken there to be sold as a slave. I begged to be shot or have my throat cut and abused the Afghans in Pushtu and in my own language, but my captor threatened to make me a Muslim on the spot if I did not keep quiet. What dreadful carnage I saw on the road, legs and arms protruding from the snow, Europeans and Hindustanis half buried. It was a sight I shall never forget as long as I live. Join us after the break where we find out what happens to the Brits who survive this absolute carnage. Join us then. Want to stay up to date on the biggest stories in pop culture and entertainment? Then be sure to check out the TMZ podcast. I'm Charlie Cotton from TMZ, the TV show, and every day I'll sit down with a member of our news team to give exclusive breakdowns of the day's most talked about headlines, stories we break, and the stories you care about. So check out the TMZ podcast, Monday through Friday, and the other podcasts from the TMZ audio network like Last Days and TMZ Verified, available on all podcast platforms. Welcome back. So before the break, it was the absolutely startling fact that 12,000 men, women and children can set out the British contingent and 200 are left after six days of walking through hell. It's cold. They've had frostbite. They've been shot at. They, you know, there, there is no escape. There's no way back. They just have to keep going forward. The women have been taken, throw themselves on the mercies of a man who has broken every single agreement that he's made. This is just a dreadful, parlous situation. Can I? Can I? Yes. Yeah. So, as the hostages head back towards Kabul, they have to pass the dead bodies from the previous day's carnage. And uh, as they're being escorted through the pile of corpses, they see these terrible scenes, sepoys and camp followers who've been stripped and robbed uh, and who refused, uh, those who refused instantly have been stabbed and cut down. With the Indian camp followers, the Afghans, if they're not interested in enslaving them, if they're not beautiful women or very virile men who could be used as slaves, they simply strip them naked and let them go into the snow knowing that they'll die. So all, there's all these people with frostbite wandering around naked, God. many crying out for help as the hostages head back to Kabul. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is Mackenzie's account. The gill's eyes had now tasted blood and clearly showed their tigerish nature, becoming very savage and fierce in their demeanor towards ourselves, demanding that we should be given up to them for sacrifice, brandishing their long blood-stained knives in our faces and telling us to look on the heaps of carcasses around us, for we should soon be among them. You came to Kabul for fruit, did you? How do you like it now, they cried. As we proceeded, we met numbers of the enemy's horse and foot returning to Kabul, laden with plunder of all kinds. One miscreant had a little Indian girl seated on the horse beside him. So these very moving scenes of, of, of absolute carnage. Where is Elphinstone in all of this, William? I mean, this is a man who is the author of this devastation in many ways because he just read everything wrong from the beginning. Uh, where is he? So Elphinstone has been unwell since the beginning of the uprising because he fell off his horse, the horse fell on him and crushed, I think, some innards or uh, anyway, he's badly injured. And he's carried off in a litter with the women. And Akbar Khan looks after the hostages, in fact, and it could be honour, but it also more likely is a realistic assessment that Dost Muhammad, who we last heard of in a pit mm. in Bukhara, he'd actually escaped from the pit and given himself up to the British and has now been sent back to British India. So there's a hostage swap. 
right exactly there. so mm. he is now living in Missouri near where Woodstock school now is he's yeah. uh, they have the, the the building is still there where he was kept and he has this little court living in India that Bakan wants to keep hostages uh, in order to swap them for his father and get his dad back yeah yeah okay all right so the the only people who do manage to make it over the holly hedge there are some i mean and not many at all do they get any respite at all once they get over it so after the holly hedge there's a few cavalrymen some lancers and the 44th foot under shelton he has somehow managed to the use make of it shelton through. The use of shelter wow. has made it through okay. and they make it another 10 or 15 miles down the valley. And at this stage, there are 20 officers and 45 privates of Shelton's 44th foot, a couple of artillerymen and sepoys. And they're exposed as dawn breaks on the top of a hill outside the village of Gundamuk, 10 miles further on from the Jugdulluk Holly Hedge. And overwhelmingly outnumbered, every hut had poured forth its inhabitants to plunder and murder, according to the one survivor, with only 20 muskets and two rounds of ammunition each. The troops decide to make their last stand. And this is the famous picture, the last stand of the 44th. Mm. And they felt that they'd been disgraced by this occasion when uh, Shelton marched them up to the top of the hill and they just fled down the hill in the end in in, uh, ignominy. So again, they form a square at the top of the hill and defend themselves, driving the Afghans several times down the hill until they had exhausted the last of their rounds and then they fought on with bayonets. But again, the Afghans know what to do with the British square. They just pull back and they shoot their gisales from a distance. And one by one, the Brits are all slaughtered. And the Afghans take only nine prisoners. One of those is Captain Thomas Souter, who wraps the regimental colours of the 44th around his waist and was taken captive by the Gilzai tribesmen who assumed that someone so colourfully dressed must be worth a ransom. Thinking I was some great man from looking so flash, he wrote, <laughs> I see it was seized by two fellows after my sword had dropped from my hand by a severe cut on the shoulder and my pistol missing fire. They hurried me from the spot to a distance, took my clothes off me except my trousers and cap, and led me away to a village. Meanwhile, the horsemen have made it to the Garden of Nimla. There's a beautiful Mughal garden which has been kept up. And I think Shah Jahan built it and left an endowment. So amazingly, amid all this chaos and anarchy, there are still gardeners keeping this beautiful garden. So they arrive there Mm. uh, and the gardeners offer them food. They haven't eaten for four days. So they get off their horses and the gardeners come with uh, must and naan, with yogurt and bread. And as they're eating the yogurt and bread, they clobber them to death with their mattocks. Wow. I mean, this is just horrific. These are like, you know, people who've gone through so much and I must be thinking, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Wow. But you also, it's an indication of how much they were hated by the Afghans. Oh, quite. So there are three men left heading towards Jalalabad. Right. And two of them are lancers. And one is the doctor of the contumement. Dr. Bryden. Dr. Bryden. And I like the story of Dr. Bryden. Tell us about him. And just when they think they're within sight of Jalalabad and they think that they can make it through and then suddenly another party of Afghan horsemen come at them. Two of the lancers are shot dead and one of them with a sword comes from Dr. Bryden and he makes a terrific sword cut onto Bryden's head. But... Dr. Brighton, a good Scotsman, mm. is a reader of Blackwood's magazine. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great story. Which is a hardback book, rather like sort of Granta, but hardback yes. in this period of history. Yeah. And he's put it inside his forage cap, uh, presumably to read when it's too cold to sleep at night. Fantastic. Uh, and the sword goes through the spine of Blackwood's magazine, but does not cut Brighton at all. Can I just say, literature <laughs> saves people. It just does. It really does save people in this case. And Dr. Bryden makes it through and gets to Jalalabad. And I actually have to say, last week, you may remember when we were last recording. Oh, yes, when you kept looking out of your window really annoyingly. (laughs) Wait for my microphone. (laughs) I need to be told off by professional broadcaster Anita Adams. I'll tell you what, I just just was trying to point out that the ear is not the most vocal part of your body as it chatted (laughs) to the microphone. It is true. But at that point, uh, I was, again, not only 10 miles away from the battlefield of Culloden, but 
uh, 10 miles away from the resting place of Dr. Bryden. And I've been to his grave on the Black Isle, on the northern shore of the Bewley Firth, looking onto Fort George. What's the inscription on it? I, it it's a couple of years since I've seen it. Huh. I, I can't remember the exact description, but it's the most peaceful and beautiful place. And this was a guy who not only survived this, he then goes <laughs> with incredibly bad luck and is posted next, having survived the first Afghan war, he's posted to Lucknow, where he survives the siege of Lucknow in 1857 to 8. Oh, my word. And then dies peacefully in his bed in the Black Isle in Scotland and buried beside the Bewley Firth. Well, he's the luckiest man of his generation, <laughs> it sounds like, or, or, but, or the unluckiest. I don't know which way you, th- you think it. But it's it's a sort of extraordinary scene. So fighting Bob Sale, mm. uh, Lady Sale's husband, is in charge of the garrison at Jalalabad. And they can hear all the gunshots and they know exactly what's going on. And they dare not go far out because they are outnumbered and they are vulnerable too. But Fighting Bob, knowing that his wife is out there, sends a search party to scour the plains, thinking that there are other British soldiers still alive, but they find only the corpses of the Lancers. And that night, lamps are raised on the gates and bugles blown to guide any last stragglers, but none limp in. A strong wind was blowing from the south, which set the sound of bugles all over the town, wrote one cadet in the Jalalabad garrison. A terrible wailing sound of those bugles I will never forget. It was a dirge for our slaughtered soldiers, heard and heard throughout the night. It had an inexpressibly mournful and depressing effect. Of the 16,500 men, women and children who left Kabul, only one had made it through. It's one of the great scenes. And of course, there's that famous picture by Lady Butler, which the Afghans started producing postcards of and selling in Kabul recently. Well, I mean, the, the, the very famous picture, describe, describe it for those. I mean, this is an audio medium. So it has Dr. Bryden limping in on his nag mm. and you can see the troops looking out from the from the walls of Jalalabad and a single white horse is, is coming through the gateway to come and rescue Dr. Bryden. And what I discovered was that, you know, for all this legend, which is the famous legend that only one man makes it from the retreat from Kabul, in actual fact, that's not true. It's a myth. And there are all sorts of fighters in the British force who know how to survive in the hills. Of course, among them are the Gurkhas. Mm -hmm. So in the week that follows, initially they think Dr. Bryden is the only survivor, but in the week that follows, many Gurkhas make it through and they've seen the Holly Hedge barrier, known what was waiting for them in the ambush, and they're not going to walk straight into an ambush. They're too smart. So they walk over the hills and they come to Jalalabad by a different, more circular route. And so I think about that. And they're, and they're in perfectly good nick. They're all right. I think there's about 100 Gurkhas that appear in perfect order wow. uh, at Jalalabad in mm-hmm. the next week. Also, more bizarrely, a man called Mr. Baness, who's the Greek grocer of the cantonment, who appears having sheltered in a cave with a bottle of ouzo for a week. That's a fabulous uh, story. <laughs> and then there's other sort of strange survivors too. Again, I mean, the, the more you look, the more you find. The following year... A bunch of sepoys give themselves up at Mirut because they have just attended the Kumela, which was at Hardwa that year. Okay, so the Kumela, for those who don't know, is a special, enormously important, significant Hindu festival, which is the um, the confluence of the different holy rivers of India and the Kum. You know that that mixing is very auspicious, and people flock. To Haridwar, which is one of the holy sites of a river. And and I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of people get to the Kumbh Mela. So that's where they went. And these guys had walked, again, they didn't go through the Holly Hedge, which was a death trap. They just walked up the mountain and came down the other side and bumped into a party of Hindu pilgrims. What we often forget is that Ghazni was a major center of the cult of the goddess of Durga. Mm. And when you go to the Kabul Museum today, or certainly pre-Taliban era, there are the huge images of Durga from Ghazni. And it was a place of Hindu pilgrimage. Mm. So these soldiers, these sepoys, having walked up the hill, come down and join in with a bunch of sadhus. I mean, I have to say, if the Taliban have left a, a statue of a very powerful woman up, I'd be very surprised. I just, It's not their bag, is it really? Well, I mean, in answer to that, the Kabul Museum is still intact this time. They haven't actually gone and, uh, and beaten it up a second time. They did the first time. But since the fall of Kabul two years ago, the Kabul Museum is shuttered, but it's still intact. Anyway, so these sepoys are escorted out of Afghanistan by the sadhus who 
tell the sepoys to dress as sadhus in order to save themselves. And the Afghans give them safe passage. They're holy men. They respect that. And they then give themselves up at Meerut cantonment after the Kumela and are tried and court-martialed. Uh, which isn't the most benign Why? response. For, 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 I mean, just, so they're just, taken to be deserters. Right. Well, they were meant to just go through the mincer with everyone else. That was the, the implication, exactly Gosh. that. Okay. So then you're left with Lady Sale, who is sent off with the other hostages and the dying Elphinstone. They pass 200 dead bodies, many of them European, the whole naked, covered with large gaping wounds, stripped of all they possessed, crawling on their hands and knees. It, many has of her the pregnant camp- daughter, does her pregnant daughter make her it? Her pregnant daughter gives birth successfully right. in captivity. Right. And at this point, Akbar Khan begins to arrange negotiations with the British to swap the women for Dost Mohammed. And that is indeed... What happens? Well, is, is there, there are stories of this time, and I don't know whether you know the veracity of, these, of, of cannibalism for these sort of people just to survive, sort of eating the flesh of comrades. So I think the least attractive fate of the camp followers who are st- often stripped naked, have lost their fingers and their toes, and so they're useless to the Afghans even as slaves. Mm. And they're literally left to go feral in the streets. And, and you're right, there are reports of cannibalism. Mm. And when the English army comes back in the Army of Retribution, which is what we'll talk about in the next episode, this terrible, terrible death force called the Army of Retribution that just wipes out everything before them. They come across hundreds of these poor characters who've just got stumps for legs, who've been left to starve, and are sitting begging outside the walls of Kabul. I mean, it's a tragic, tragic fate. And is there, I mean, because this is such a tragic fate, and often you see, even when there is a victorious army and the, the, you know their opponents are so traduced and reduced and destroyed, there's often compassion. Is there compassion from the Afghans for what has happened here? Absolutely not. And we know this because one of the, the most exciting finds when I was researching this book was this account of this Afghan who is with the British force called Mirza Atta. And he's a very proud Afghan, very proud of what he's done. And yet he's reporting, in a sense, from the British ranks. And he's seeing the British meet the fate they deserve, in his view. And his account, uh, when he writes this chilling account of the defeat of the British and the total destruction of this army, He writes, it is said that 40,000 English troops had been in Kabul and that many were taken captive en route. Others remained as cripples and beggars in Kabul and that the rest perished in the mountains like a ship sunk without trace. For it is no easy thing to invade and occupy the kingdom of Khorasan. Well... On that note, um, we are going to leave it for this episode, but join us for the next Empire podcast when we talk about the army of retribution. Till then, it's goodbye from me, Anita Arnon. And me, William Durimple.